I'm Terrence Mickey, and I'm here with my co-director, Fred Keenitz, documentary One Billion Orgasms, and you're listening to So Booking Cool with the lovely Jewel B. Welcome to So Booking Cool, it's Jewel B. In this episode, I chatted with Brent Keenitz and Terrence Mickey, who are the directors of the new documentary, One Billion Orgasms, which is about a middle-aged engineer who decides to prove his worth by inventing a device he dreams will make him responsible for one billion orgasms. To learn more about this film and about Brent and Terrence, get in on the conversation and check out this interview. Trust me, you don't want to miss it. So what is the heart and the soul of, would you say, of One Billion Orgasms? Well, the heart and soul is Aaron Headley, who's the main character. Mm -hmm. And Aaron is somebody who expected to be exceptional in life. And the very interesting is he didn't reach the kind of goals that he wanted to reach. But he did invent a watch, which facilitates female ejaculation, which he has kind of poured his whole, you know, all his ambition in and all of his obsession with sex into to kind of prove his worth to the world. So it's really a very American state of the entrepreneur who's trying to change the world, and he puts all his money, resources, passion into this. So Aaron, it's a very unconventional um, invention, to say the least. So I, something else that I have to ask is, does Aaron represent the phrase that it's never too late for someone to go after their dream? It's a great question. Um, and uh, I think that story is still yet to be told. I think what uh, what Aaron's uh, story really represents is, um, to some extent, is a reflection for all of us to think about what are our hopes and dreams what do they mean to us, and why are we really pursuing them? And I think kind of uncovering, uh, you know, this kind of what on the surface is sort of, um, you know, it's a, it's a great one-liner. I met a guy flying on an airplane who was trying to tell me a watch that, you know, triggered female ejaculation, and you kind of dismiss it as like, uh, wow, that's a crazy story. And it was the same I met Aaron at a high school reunion. Aaron and I went to high school together. And uh, at our 20th reunion, out comes this move that he's now turned into a watch. And, uh, and you know, um, you kind of tend to look at these situations and, and sort of just throw them into a category of kind of extremely crazy or extremely odd or, or you know, whatever. And what our movie really tries to do at its heart and soul is peel back the layers on that and help us understand how this one individual got to that place. And then maybe, you know, spend a little bit of time reflecting on our hopes and dreams and what we're doing to uh, pursue our passions and, uh, you know, why we have those passions in the first place. What are some important lessons that you think people who do want to start their own business or their own invention can learn from this documentary? That's a good question, too. Um, there, there's a lot in here that I think people watch and they say, oh, I would have done it this way or I would have done it that way or mm -hmm. why doesn't he do this or why doesn't he? I can, I can see people all the time kind of chomping at the bit to give him instructions through the screen and uh, suggestions. So I think what people will see, though, at the end of the day is that as a, at a fundamental level, Aaron has such a uniquely unbridled passion, singular focus on spreading the word about this this move that he's discovered and has since turned into kind of measurable by a watch. Um, that that singular focus at its fundamental foundation is is absolutely uh, critical to having the wherewithal to keep going. Um, because what the movie does show also is you 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 run into a lot of complications. Some of them. Uh, you know, there's always bumps in the road in any journey, and uh, sometimes we're, we're, we create our own obstacles as well, and all that kind of comes out of, the, out of the movie as well. Oh, I'm sorry, I lost the last part of what you said. Oh, I was just saying that um, we can see all these, uh, well, in, in any endeavor, you run into a lot of uh, bumps in the road, and that's just life. Uh, um, and our movie certainly shows that, and it also uh, shows how some of those uh, bumps are uh, actually created by us ourselves. Um, so our movie kind of uh, kind of uncovers that, discovers that, and lets us kind of witness that in a real-time uh, way with Aaron, 
But at the end of the day, the one thing that keeps them going, I think, is just a singular commitment and a singular passion to spread the word about this news. Wow. So with this movie, then, um, did you structure like the footage based on the narrative that you wanted to tell or do you get in or does Aaron get in contact with you and say, hey, you know, you guys have to like include this? How How does that work? We had full control of the story that we were telling. So we followed Aaron for various parts of his life and various places that kind of went back to the world and lost footage. Um, and it's really, you know, you're overwhelmed by how much footage you have. Plus, he gave us all this archival footage of his family and his, his parents. So we had this really kind of complete life story. And in editing it, we were very aware that Aaron is somebody that's going to be very provocative mm-hmm. and very, um, you know, challenging for people. He's going to judge him very quickly. So we wanted to craft the narrative in a way that people could get into his life story um, in a way that they were empathetic towards him and compassionate towards him. And then we could take you on the journey to expose the, the many facets of him, like we all have many facets. And so by the end of the picture, you really have a fuller representation of him. And often people are very divided about how they feel. And we don't judge, we don't put any editorial um, cast on it. We just let you watch him on you know, as he's doing what he's doing. And it leaves you, the audience, with a real question of, like, how do I feel about this rather than how do the directors feel? And, yeah, that it, we did, as we were going through the editing process, we, we collected over 80 hours of footage in our first filming where we followed him to the AVN conference. So we had about three days of him preparing for the AVN Expo in Las Vegas, which is the adult video news uh, entertainment expo that takes place annually in Las Vegas and it's a it's a big expo for people who've produced adult content whether that's through toy sex toys or other sorts of adult content or adult oriented uh, products to kind of take a booth and 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 you know kind of market their invention or their wares or their services so Aaron is one of those booth uh, managers. So he's taken out a booth and he's in Las Vegas. We follow that and we get all this footage. And that's uh, kind of a story, but we realized, you know, and, and a lot of things happen and, you know, it kind of takes you on a ride with twists and turns. But we realized that the, what everybody wanted to know and what everybody wanted to understand at the end of watching cuts of that footage was who is this guy? Like how did he mm-hmm. get to be the guy he became? Um, and that was, and, and it was, it was a great moment for Terrence and me because um, we realized that's exactly what brought us into the story in the first place. It wasn't, we weren't, he didn't approach us; we approached him. We weren't looking to make a movie about a squirt watch, as he calls it, or about female ejaculation. We were really just intrigued by how does one individual become so singularly committed uh, to bringing this out into the world, and for the first almost decade of his time trying to bring this into the world and train people on how to do this, he didn't have a product to sell them. He was just offering training videos, pamphlets, brochures. He would even, you know, talk to you on the phone and help you understand how to do it. So it was just it was just fascinating to us on the human level, and that's what we what we got back to at the end of the day with the structure of our story. Mm-hmm. One of my favorite moments in the film is when Aaron does say that a lot of his friends, you know, his his peers and stuff, they live in mansions and stuff. But he, from what I got from what he said, is that he chose to invest in his invention. That's absolutely true. Yeah, and he, you know, it's 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 cost him money because he is a he isn't a, a degreed electrical engineer and um, has had success in that uh, field. Um, and has made makes a, a decent income. Uh, he says a six figure income. So mm-hmm. it's a it's a it's a good solid engineering income. And uh, most people who aren't spending a lot of money in other places can kind of over the years, you know, develop a nice uh, lifestyle on that sort of income. Um, but he has chosen to put that money back into this what he calls his night job. Um, and what's his real dream? And uh, he doesn't. There's never. It's never a question. There's never any. Uh, and you see this in the movie. There's never any hesitation to say, "Oh, maybe I should have done it differently," or, 
uh, nothing like that. And we mm-hmm. tried, you know, we tried to really poke at those holes in the ego or the holes in the psyche, and uh, they just weren't exposed. He's committed to this at great cost to himself. How did you both partner with Gravita's Ventures? What well, well, was the question? Sorry, I'm just going to cut out. We, we, oh, we took the film up to a market. Uh, up, so the question was, how did we partner with Gravitas or Gravitas? Gravitas. I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but yeah. Gravitas. But, Gravitas. but we, we Gravitas. went up to uh, the Hot Docs Film Festival in Toronto last May, or I think it was the end of April, beginning of May, and they have a market there where you can bring finished films that don't have a distributor, and you can sit down and you put first. It's really cool, actually. You put your film up on a website that that Hot Docs hosts, and there's probably 300 other films up there as well. And then there's about 150 distributors or sales agents who are also represented, and everybody looks at each other before the event and kind of clicks on the projects or the distributors that they're interested in meeting with. And then Hot Docs organizes a schedule, and it's a 15-minute speed dating day. So Terrence and I started at 8 in the morning and went till 5 in the afternoon, and just every 15 minutes they'd ring a bell, and we'd change seats and meet with another distributor. Gravitas was one of those distributors. Um, and we had great you know, chemistry with the uh, representative, um, who's actually the founder of Gravitas, who was up there. Uh, and then we just kind of continued the dialogue after that, and it just made a lot of sense. It was a good fit for us and for this film, um, given what they do and where they put the film. All right. So you guys, you both did such an excellent job, like, with creating this film, and this is your first time directing a film? Our first feature, our first documentary, our first, first about everything. You're all, you're almost our first interview. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm I'm pleased about that. <laughs> you know, there'll be yeah. a lot more to come. Yeah. But yeah, wow. How did you guys like? Was it hard to do it for the first time, or you knew what you wanted to do? Did you study other films? You know, I, I would say for me, and I, we we might have different answers to this question, but for me. Uh, I thought the hardest part, I always say this, I thought the hardest part was going to be finding a story. And, and then once we found it, that was that was pretty easy. Then I thought the hard part was going to be just capturing the footage. And um, that was hard in the moment, but looking back on it, it was pretty easy. We just ran around chasing this guy with the camera, and he was fantastic in the sense that he just gave us access, access to everything, but he was also himself while we were around with a camera in his face. And it's not every person that can can be that way. So so that went kind of smoothly. Then we started editing, and that was hard. That was really, really a hard process. Um, and, you know, this story is complicated. And the character, as Terrence mentioned, is polarizing. So just kind of getting to the story that reflected the story we wanted to tell, but was also truthful to what happened and what is happening, and also has a beginning, middle, and end, um, that that took a lot of work and a lot of time and just more months than I can even imagine uh, it could have, could have taken. I can't even really say it because I'm, uh, I am I can't, without gulping on it, I can't understand how it took so long, but it was a ton of work. Um, but then, you know, we have to sell the movie, and uh, that, that was a lot of work too. And uh, eventually we got the deal with Gravitas, and that was great. Now delivering and marketing the movie, that's a whole other animal. And it was really, that's been really challenging as well. It's been really fun all the way along, but, uh, it, it, I have to say, it's been a lot more work than I ever would have thought. And I have tremendous respect for anybody who gets a movie out there into the world, however they do it. And, uh, and, uh, because there's just so many components. Many of them are very technical. Some of them are highly administrative. Others go into the area of legal and insurance and accounting and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, it's a lot of work to get a movie out in the world, and it was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. So what advice would you give to aspiring filmmakers? I think the one thing that I would say, which was based on our experience, is we you know, we had a filmmaker friend in New York who just said, jump in and start filming. And we did that. And you can plan, you can hem, and you can haw, but there's something about just taking the plunge and start shooting and seeing what unfolds that I think was probably the best advice we've gotten. Because 
if we knew all of the, this work beforehand, we probably would have been much more hesitant, but partly naivete and partly encouragement. We jumped in and, you know, it took us for on an incredible ride. And we could have never have known at the start where we would have ended up. But there's something about just kind of getting the camera, getting the subject, and following them and seeing what happens, which is really just an important part of the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree completely. I think that's great advice because until you start rolling camera, you don't, especially in a documentary, uh, most documentaries anyhow, and certainly character study documentaries, you don't know what you're dealing with. So um, you've just got to get out there and start rolling camera. And as you do that, you get more and more comfortable with the process of, of filming, but you also get, you know, you start to build a relationship with your subject or subjects and it just deepens the whole experience. The other com element that I would add uh, to what Terrence said is really fall in love with the project. Find a way to fall in love with it, and if you can't find a way to fall in love with it, change projects, <laughs> you know, cut your bait, because it is always going to be a lot more work than you think it is, and even when you think you're done, there's going to be a lot more work to do after that. It just is the nature of finishing a film and getting it out into the world. Um, and if you don't love your project, it's going to be really hard to hang in there with it. And uh, so so find a way to fall in love with your project. Um, we certainly have had to keep doing that over and over again with this project. And, um, and it's been important because we need that staying power to stick with it and believe in it and uh, keep going. That's excellent advice. What do you both want everyone to take away from One Billion Orgasms to film? I, I would love for it to really inspire people to look at themselves and their understanding of their passion, sexuality, and, you know, what they want out of life. I think that you can look at Aaron's story and really begin to think about your own life and what weight do you put into, you know, sex, your intimacy, relationships, and... You know, for me, just kind of following him and editing him, it really made me think about my own relationships, my own relationship to sex, and really, really think hard about what's healthy and what's, what do I want for myself. And in a lot of ways, Aaron is inspiring in that way of encouraging people to be, you know, without shame and to really explore themselves. And I would love for people to really meditate on that for themselves, whether in a relationship or outside of the relationship. But there's a lot of messaging that goes on, a lot of, you know, misinformation in the culture, and a lot of expectations of what we're supposed to be as men and women, um, straight or gay. And I think that that's, that's what I would want people to consider. Mm. And I, I could also take it and, and take it externally and say another hope that I have uh, for, for the movie is that people will look more look for more dimensions in the people that we run across in ordinary life. Um, I think it's easy for people to sort of run into a character like Aaron, run across a character like Aaron, and sort of kind of compartmentalize him one dimensionally as this kind of uh crazy guy they met who's pitching this watch to do female ejaculation and it sounds kind of like a Wow, that guy, you know, is 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 what a character, you know, and they just kind of. But I I think that we in this world of you know people are Democrats or the Republicans, we're divided by this or divided by that. We're red states, we're blue states, we're, you know. But at the end of the day, we're all humans, and the more we can try to kind of do what I hope this movie does, which is take this character who most of us might sort of put in a very specific category and then set them up, set them in their place. Uh, and kind of unpeel that and understand that a little bit more about the, those that we're kind of coexisting with. Um, I just think it's an important discipline for us to take into life, especially when we're facing so many kind of societal challenges that threaten to kind of divide us more than unify us um, to see people this way. And also, I think also, you know, in the Me Too environment, there's a lot of villains out there, and they've done a lot of bad things, and I think that that, uh, is is not something that you, you know is not deserved, but I think until we start to try to understand how people are becoming this way and why people are becoming this way, 
we're not really going to make progress to having a society that's more caring, giving, loving, and uh, respectful of each other. So I, uh, that's, a, that's another direction of, of the movie, looking outward rather than inward, but um, it's certainly a hope that I have that the story can kind of bring out. Wow. Brent Keenet and Terrence Mickey, everyone. It's great talking to you. Everyone, you have to see One Billion Orgasms. Tell us more about how people can access this must-watch documentary. You can find out all the information at our website, which is onebillionorgasms.com. Uh, you can use the number one or the letter one, letters spelled out, but it's onebillionorgasms.com. And you can get all the information on where you can buy the movie. You can pre-order it now on iTunes, and we would love to see people pre-ordering uh, the film on iTunes. It helps get it into a better space uh, there, and uh, we'd, we'd love to encourage people to, to do that. And how can people keep up with you? We have a Twitter handle, which is at uh, orgasmsdocfilm, mm-hmm. at orgasms, plural, docfilm. Um, you can also uh, sign up on our website. It'll pop up a, a subscribe button so you can get on our mailing list. And we have a Facebook page. You can search for One Billion Orgasms on Facebook and you'll find our page. You can follow us there. Um, so Twitter, Facebook, and our website are the best ways to you know reach us uh, and to become part of the discussion around this film. I can't wait to see you know what's next for Aaron. Do you guys know? We're watching that carefully, and uh, who knows? Maybe there's a story there, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm <laughs> we'll, sure. We'll there. let you know. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah, would love to have you both on again in the future. Um, thank you to... Yeah, no problem. And thank you to all the listeners, and until next time, so booking cool.